Jacopo Anase is an assistant professor in the Department of Radiology. He is a computational neuroautonomist. Sorry, that's my first big mistake with all these big words, right? He is a computational neuroanatomist whose formal training stems from a broad background in the biological sciences and the neurosciences. Tonight, he will share plans for a new UC San Diego-based structural map of the human brain based on novel neuroimaging methods developed by Jacopo and his team that will provide researchers worldwide with 2D and 3D images containing unprecedented levels of detail. This proposed digital model of the human brain will be a reference template for mapping the results of multiple studies under the BRAIN Initiative, Brain Research Through Advancing Innovative Neurotechnologies, announced by the Obama administration in April of 2013. UC San Diego's very own faculty, Nick Spitzer and Ralph Greenspan, were part of the scientific dream team that helped craft the Presidential Brain Initiative and are leading UC San Diego's collaborative of faculty from across the campus who will contribute to this multifaceted, groundbreaking initiative. Please join me in welcoming our final speaker this evening, Jacopo Anase, who will share with us his important contributions for this endeavor. My name is hard enough, but neuroanatomist gets everyone. <laughs> <laughs> From now on, I'm going to be a cosmoanatomist. I think that's really, really cool. Actually, if you bear with me, it does make sense because um, we do have a universe inside our head, and it's our brain. And uh, that is what I study. That's the object, object of my passion, desires, curiosity, obsession sometimes, unfortunately. And, uh, it, and there is a paradox that I'm very interested in. Is the paradox is that the mind is potentially infinite. At least we feel that our mind is infinite, but the brain is actually an organ. And it's all in between our ears, in uh, three pounds of flesh in between our ear. And that actually makes it very challenging, too, because it is flesh, and as fle flesh rots, so you have to study it quickly uh, or preserve it. And also, it, it took a few hundred years for, uh, for scientists to, to develop methods to study how the mind works inside three lumps of flesh. Now, fortunately, in the last 30 years, I would say, uh, we have had great help from a technical magnetic resonance imaging and it allowed us really to look inside our heads or to look at our body inside our body without having to dissect. Uh, and magnetic resonance image, or MRI, uh, is what gives us these beautiful images of the cerebral cortex. And most importantly, what the field is excited about these days is the, the connectivity pattern inside the brain. This is really where neuroscience now is, at least human brain mapping, is focusing on many resources. Now, the, there is a, there's a big limitation. Uh, it, it's a great tool because, as I say, it's non-invasive, and it's an, a, a great diagnostic tool, but it has its limitations. So if we zoom in, when we zoom in these MRI images, we see very quickly that there's not a lot of information there. So most of our knowledge about disease, uh, neurological disease or brain development, is really looking at very global effects. So in my lab, we actually go far beyond this resolution. And so again, to make the metaphor with uh, cosmology, the, the microscope is my telescope. And I sort of turn it around and I look at brains. I was talking about the time, because I really want to find out why is this pixel in an MRI image bright? And, and, and it's actually a lesion in multiple sclerosis. And why is this pixel dark? And it's normal white matter. White matter is the term we give to all the fibers that connect different places in our brain. So to do that, and I hope you're not planning to eat at a deli tonight, because I'm going to show some uh, how we <laughs> slice in brains. We have to physically dissect the brain. And, and, a, and a method we develop is actually doing neuroimaging as we slice the physical brain. So it's like doing a very, very high resolution MRI. We're talking about microns. So we're talking about hair thin slices. And, and here's me whip, picking it up with a brush. I love using brushes. It makes me feel like I'm an artist. And it, this is a science and an art as well, because you need to be very careful and, 
is full of uh, challenges as a technique. So here we're slicing a, a frozen brain encased in a gelatin cast. And this is really a steel, a very sharp steel braid, very, very sharp. And, we, and it takes us about 53 hours. Now, this is, believe it or not, this is fast forward. We're going faster. We, we only have uh, probably seven minutes left, so we cannot cut the whole brain. Uh, and so I'll move forward. But this is a beautiful technique because and as we do that procedure, we image the brain, and so we can, we can create movies. We can create movies of individual brain space. And this is the first step towards this very high resolution map, which will tell us more about brain structure. Brain structure is actually one of the priorities established by the National Institute of Health as part of the Obama Brain Mapping Initiative. So I'm very lucky in that respect that they, that they left some money for anatomy. And here we're traveling through. We're going from the front of the brain to the back of the brain, sensing a weak work in about a minute. But we don't have a minute, so I'm also going to leave you. I'm going to have to sacrifice the visual cortex, which is around here, and the beautiful cerebellum. But I want to show you the cerebellum, because this is very beautiful. And then we have to take all these slices. Well, one, one brain produces about, uh, with this technique, we, have, we end up with about uh, 2,500 or 3,000 tissue slices. Tissue, you, uh, it's the fabric of the brain. This is the real tissue. And this needs to be laid out on uh, large format glass slides. Because what we want to see in the brain, we cannot see it unless we look at this material. And in fact, this material is actually, and here we see again the paintbrush. I told you, it's a fixation of mine. And the, the brain is like a book that's written with magic ink. If we don't use chemicals to reveal the features we want to observe, like Alzheimer's lesions or uh, cells or, or axons, we don't see anything. It's very translucent. So we use dyes and antibodies and molecular probes to really look at the language of the brain. And moving forward. So, and this is really, remember that dark pixel that I showed you? This is what's in it. It's like a very complicated bundle of fiber. These are only a few, up, a few microns thick, so a few thousands of a millimeter thick fibers. And, and we need to understand where these fibers are going. This is the map that I'm trying to create, a map of connectivity at the microscopic level. We need to understand. And in order to do that, we build special microscopes that can take a whole slice that we the, with a silver impregnation, for example, and we can create, using a, a montage, we create files that are enormous. If we could print one of these files, it would occupy the price center. It would be a canvas that it, we could lay out, or we could, in fact, upholster a whole building, which would be a beautiful art project. So we use motorized stages to take a picture of the at microscopic resolution of one of the 2,500 slices. So remember, this process has to be repeated 2,500 times. We're, we have done now about 400 slices for this particular brain at this level. And we use Google software, which is free on the web, API. It's a great thing. I didn't have to reinvent it completely. We had to modify it to create these Google maps of the brain, which we go from the entire brain to looking at the individual, I would call it the alleyways of the brain. You know, MRI gives us the general map of the freeways, but really the entire economic and social activity of a city happens also in small streets, in the alleyways, in the back alleys of the houses. And as I said, these are very, very tiny. So our images are extremely large. And then we use algorithms now to analyze each of these images, and, and it gives us the direction where these fibers are going. And it's like, a, it's like an enormous puzzle. Each, each slice is about 60,000 little pieces of a puzzle. And multiply that by 2,500, just to give you an idea of the scope of the work. So why do we need to understand this? You know, the, the most difficult question that a scientist can be given, so don't write it in your cards, is, is the why. So the why is very, uh, there's several reasons. I mean, these are, these are the fibers where the memory of our first kiss travels, where the memory is created, where we, where we perceive beauty in an object, in our, in, in our wife. But it's also, you know, uh, very disquietingly so, it's also, we, we now know that, for example, Alzheimer's disease, creeps along these fibers. So we need to really understand how the process happens to try to stop progressive neurology. And then I have the type of canvases that we create. I also have another why, which is more personal, which is understanding also how does this very complicated that we have inside our head creates who we are, our personality. And, and in order to do that, there was something missing. 
you know, because we generate one petabyte of data. This, this map is going to be a petabyte of data, which is equivalent to a billion e-books on a Kindle, if they'll build it, or streaming 3,000 years of MP3 music. So it's a lot of data, so that's another challenge. But why do that? Whose brain is it anyway? I mean, we're studying human brains. We're not, I'm not studying mice, so I, need to know, I needed to know where this brain came from. And what I did is that I went back, you know, for every brain that I studied, some human being has to donate it generously as a gift to my laboratory. And I found out that he was an artist, so, and, I, and I found them. I found the person who donated the brain, and he was actually a painter. He was a painter who, who used to uh, create portraits of uh, purebreds and racehorses for clients here in San Diego. He lived in Encinita. So this individual donated his brain, and in, es in essence, we are, we're, really trying, we're really creating the map of the brain of a painter, which I think highlights the humanistic approach of this work. So before we end, Q, <laughs> I give you sort of a preview of this first stage of creating this, the, of, not, of an exploration in the universe of the mind of a painter, so to speak. And here is uh, where the representation of uh, his hands was. He needed that to, to use his brushes. And now we're going to step into this three-dimensional reconstruction and reach all the way into the areas in the ventral side of the brain that our brain uses to perceive uh, aesthetics and also to perceive faces and, believe it or not, even to perceive categories of animals. So there are some horse cells down there. And I wish there was some music accompanying this. I didn't bring my little piano keyboard player, but next time. And this is the hippocampus here coming out. It, these are incredible views. These are unprecedented views of the brain that we're just really showing here for the first time. And uh, so we're really dissecting virtually this brain specimen. So uh, our, our organ now, our organic object, has become a collection of digital data. We virtualize this brain. The next step is to virtualize the entire brain at cellular resolution. One petabyte of data, an estimated cost probably of $2 million to do that. But I think it's worth it. Thank you.